Um, my name is Kate Stewart. Um, I'm working at the Linux Foundation. I'm trying to focus on what do we need to do to make sure that um, embedded open source is dependable. And one of the key features of open source in general and systems is Linux kernel. And Daniel German, um, professor at UVic. And Daniel, you want to just introduce yourself. Just across the street uh, from Seattle, I'm in Canada, British Columbia, and uh, so I've been doing research on open source for um, a little bit more than 20 years. So um, one of my main goals in research is to understand how open source is developed, and then try to um, identify interesting aspects um, of the development, interesting practices that then can be uh, documented and promoted and. Uh, for example, one of the, uh, we were, um, my team was one of the uh, first to identify that uh, code reviews done, done in the way that Apache and the kernel do are a very effective way of uh, doing code reviews. And uh, so we were the first to have a paper related to that. And now uh, they are common and used everywhere. And um, so that's a little bit about who I am. Um, I do a little bit of open source here and there. Uh, I maintain my own projects. And um, I also uh, contribute, most of the time, uh, drive-by contributions to open source. And, um, and as much as possible, I try to use open source in my own, um, in my own life. And uh, so I'm a big proponent and a big user of open source also. Thank you. Yeah, back to you. What? So one of the tools we've been using is a project called Kregit. And this is looking at the Git commis history in the Linux kernel over the years. Um, Kregit.linuxsources.org, anyone can go to and explore who's made which contributions, what's going on there, and so forth. But um, Daniel's been able to um, summarize the information behind him. We've been sort of exploring this data set as a way of understanding what's happening from a trend perspective. There are over 21,000 unique contributors that we've identified, and there's 33,000 emails associated with those 21,000 contributors. So it's a rather large data set. We've also done a little bit of work um, using uh, the gender computer to try to map people's names to their gender, so we can start to look at some of the trends from a diversity perspective. Uh, we have been, since 2018, we've been doing manual verification as we new people join the community. And some, people, some of the names are very hard to classify. If you guys have questions, since we're a small group, I'd like to make this as interactive as possible. <laughs> but um, if you've got questions, um, you know, feel free to just sort of raise your hands. But that's sort of what, we've, what the background is behind the numbers you'll be seeing and the data. So one of the key things is um, the tokens and the evidence in the kernel persists. Every release is built on the prior releases. Um, one way or the other, and actually, we can actually still find tokens in the source code repository from that very first release last back in 1991. Um, currently, if you look at the whole size of the tokens for the kernel, there's 119 million tokens that make up the kernel today as of 514. And you know, the portions obviously um, these are done by year rather than by release. So we've got everything sort of segmented by year base and the get commits by year. But you know, the bulk of the new work is, you know, last few years have show, show that. So when you start looking, you know, there's a lot of contributions in the last couple of years, and this year isn't over yet, so it'll probably be more by the time it ends. But as you can sort of see, all of these together make up what we're using today as a kernel. And so that's what we're using as a basis for the analysis. Now the tokens do get replaced over time. When we first did some of this analysis last year, there was, uh, the there was you know, 2,964 tokens uh, that were from those first, that first commits back in 1991. It's gone down a bit. Some of the things are like, you know, people clean up sections, people refactor code, things like that, and that sort of adjusts and changes things. Oops, that was interesting. But, as you can see, it doesn't really register on the percentage, but it's still there. There's still those traces of it, and it could be, you know, semicolons, brackets, variable names, a couple of things like that. Uh, some of the work that's going on in real time is actually touching some of this older code. 
um, prints and things like that, and then other parts where people are cleaning up the print structures and things like that. That's all very much of the impacts that we're seeing. But when you start looking, you know, last year when we measured 2020, it was done again about the same time. And then we added, by the end of the year, there was over 12,000, oh, sorry, 12 million more tokens added into that 514 kernel. And so we're at about the same point again here. So those, these percentages are the ones you saw on that prior depth chart. But, you know, we can trace back exactly where these pieces are. Um, for people's um, quick show, do you know, guys all know what I mean when I say token? Raise your hands, or do you want me to explain that? Sort of? Okay, I got, I got, thank you for, thank you for the feedback. Um, so, if you have a line of code, and you parse it into, say, you know, um, the compiler takes it, translates your code into machine language. The, part, the, trans, the process of transforming from a line of C source file into machine language, it looks at every little element, syntactic element, be it a variable, be it punctuation, like brackets, commas, things like that. Each of those things is considered to be a token. And that is probably the lowest common denominator. So what this analysis has done with Craigit is basically look at working uh, the analysis at the lowest syntactic element. You're doing git blame on the token level effectively. Because lines change, white space changes, things like that. The tokens are actually a more immutable concept for getting more precision on the analysis. So if you look at this by release, um, what's been happening in the last year is, and you look at back, you know, all the way back, in this last release, we actually did see a record number of contributors on one of the releases. And there were so various articles in LWN and other places about some of the analysis that was done. And, you know, Linus has basically commented. So we sort of got curious about, okay, well, what's been happening across the space? And the part that I'm also interested in is what's been happening to women across this space what's been happening to the diversity. Because you can sort of see here this line at the bottom is the women. And this is sort of, as you can see, it's been very slowly growing. And we were starting to see a bit of acceleration towards the end of 2019. But it was sort of looking like, hmm, you know, I don't know if, we, I don't know if we're statistically significant or not, but nonetheless, it was sort of like, you know, is it keeping up or not? So this was sort of the question we started exploring with the data to try and understand really what's going on. Overall, though, you can see that um, last year was, you know, by year, it was, um, you know, probably the highest number of contributors that participated in the kernel. And in terms of the commits, got the highest number of commits when you start looking at it by year. So this data, it's indicating that the kernel is doing quite well. And given the fact that most of the community is virtual, um, and everyone's sort of working, can work remotely. I think that's been a large part of the success of, you know, the kernel's been continuing to grow. However, there are some interesting factors there. So, Daniel, you want to take it over from here and just tell me when to switch the slides? Um, sure. I can, I can continue talking. And, uh... Uh... <clears throat> so, um, one of the things that fascinates me about the kernel is just the number of, um, the, the sheer size of, of the project, the age of the project, and, uh, and how it, it just keeps um, growing and, uh, over time. And um, so, um, as a system, it's a very complex, very interesting. And uh, so, as a researcher, then um, I'm very curious about how uh, it keeps working. And um, so, as we were discussing before, so there's a very interesting trend uh, in terms of the growth of number of contributors. Now, uh, <clears throat> what's interesting here is that this is just the uh, the, the number of people. Um, this doesn't take into consideration how much each one of them contributes. It just basically means that as time passes by, then the kernel keeps bringing more and more and more people. And um, 
who contribute. And in here, the contribu by contribution, we mean uh, they are either the author or the committer of a commit. And uh, we know that the kernel is a complex system. So um, it's not only the people who write the code, but uh, the focus that we have at this point is uh, of the people who are responsible for uh, whatever is in their um, source code repository. Um, <clears throat> we also know, so we have done a little bit of work before, that uh, the kernel is not only the source code that exists in Linux Torvald's uh, repository. There are many other repositories that exist around the world and uh, that might never synchronize fully with uh, the rest of the repositories. So think, for example, uh, of Android. So um, the people at Google probably have a repository of Android that is heavily based on the original uh, one of the Linux kernel, but it lives on its own and uh, it has its own entity and it probably never fully synchronized again back. So uh, this is the, the, the view that we have is a relatively restricted one uh, in that sense. And, um, but um, this is the core of the, uh, the development team and without these people, we would not have a kernel. Uh, everybody's necessary, but uh, these are fundamental for the success of uh, the project. Um, the number of contributors also correlates with the increase on the commits per year. And uh, so we can see um, the, the, the two plots are relatively uh, the same. And uh, so as time passes by, the number of commits also keeps growing. So the kernels grow in terms of the number of files, the number of lines of code, the number of contributors, uh, the number of commits and uh, that get into it. And uh, so from the outside, uh, you could um, assert that the kernel looks like a healthy um, environment. <clears throat> now, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about was uh, the impact of, um, of time and uh, especially because we have been in, in very uh, interesting times for the last um, year and a half. So we wanted to see whether there was anything that uh, looked significantly different from the way the development was. Uh, personally, uh, my hypothesis was that uh, COVID would have relatively little impact on the development of the kernel. Why? Because fundamentally the kernel is a distributed uh, software development project. Most of the people uh, rarely meet face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, most of the communication is done online. Yes, there are events uh, that bring people together, but in general, the kernel is being developed uh, by people in their own computers. So whether they did, did it in, in an office or they did it at home, uh, it will probably have relatively little impact. The other thing that um, um, I have observed is that there's a lot of development that is sponsored by uh, an employer. So if the employer said you have to keep developing from home um, or from the office, then it probably makes a uh, little difference. There's probably an impact in terms of those that they're volunteers, the ones that give their time uh, on, their, on their free evolution uh, to the kernel. And they might be a little bit of a difference in terms of newcomers to the kernel. Uh, we might see a little bit of that uh, later. But overall, as you can see here, the number of contributors varies a lot from month to month. Well, not a lot. And, uh, we're talking about uh, maybe a difference of 100 uh, developers from one month uh, to the next. Each one of these points in this plot is uh, a month. And um, so um, as you can see here, we have around 1,000 people, uh, 1,500 people, 1,600 people, uh, contributors in a given month. And here I plotted the, the, the number of them who we have identified as women. Uh, there's also a little bit of variability, but because there are fewer people, the, 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 the peaks and the valleys are um, uh, smaller. Uh, but it's also interesting to see that this is essentially a growing trend and uh, it will take a long, long time before it becomes 50% at this rate, but it's a healthy increase over time. And uh, so we're seeing around 7%, um, 8% of contributors who are uh, women participating uh, in the development of the kernel. One of the things that Daniel pointed out that I found fascinating, and it's obvious when you think about it, is um, August and December, there's pretty much always a drop in the contributors. 
Yeah, so um, I wanted to zoom in into the plot that, we, that I showed before. And uh, so here is just the last uh, three years, essentially. So um, this line here is January, this line here is January, this line here is January. And, uh, and there, there is an ability that um, basically you will expect and um, there is always a dip around December. So December people, uh, sorry, uh, in December people uh, uh, do a little bit less. And um, sorry, let me rephrase that. Um, some people do not contribute in December and, they, and then uh, some more people come back in January. Uh, September, October, uh, uh, September, October, November. And uh, we see a little bit of an uptick and um, uh, we also see a little bit of a dip in terms of the summer. So the summer months, some people actually leave, but uh, in the big scope of things, uh, the curve remains relatively um, um, straight. So uh, those, those variations are small, and uh, which I guess that if a lot of people are being employed, then um, they will work most of the year and then only take a few uh, weeks of uh, vacation most of the time. So that's why we probably have this stability around uh, 1,100 people. Uh, women kind of have so few of them to really see any kind of seasonal uh, variation. There is still a little bit of a dip around December, but um, not that much. And uh, there's nothing really to make a strong conclusion with respect to this. So um, these numbers are about contributors. So these are a number of people who at any given month, they have contributed to the kernel. And um, this is commits. Um, and commits are a little bit of a tricky measure because uh, not all commits are created equal. Uh, we may have a huge commit that has a lot of work that took a lot of time to be developed, or we might have just a small change to which was just change a comment because the comment had incorrect grammar. We see both uh, cases of commits. And uh, so each one of them individually uh, is different. What is interesting is the overall trend more than the specific uh, peaks and valleys. And as you can see here again, so there's a, a healthy uh, growth in terms of that. And, uh, and then um, there's seasonality, but it's kind of uh, uh, harder to see because the variance is so big between one month and the other. And uh, we can see it also here uh, with women, there's a lot of uh, variability at any year, uh, from one month uh, to the next. And I guess uh, if I'm a developer and I'm tasked to do a job, uh, this month it might require one commit, the next month it might require three, and, uh, and the one commit might actually require more hours than three commits. So it's always a tricky uh, metric to, uh, to use. <clears throat> This is again zooming in just to actually see what is what is going on, and as I said before, just a lot of variability. So not very useful to try to make a, a strong assertion of what's going on. And these are the COVID bonds, as you can see here. Um, in terms of commits, it's relatively flat, and uh, from 2018, 19, and then in 2020, we have way more ups and downs. So there is a peak going up right at the beginning of the pandemic. It keeps going on and then it starts to actually vary a lot from one month to the other. So um, again, so very hard to make any strong uh, assertion about what is going on. Uh, one of the hypotheses that we have, and, uh, and it's a hypothesis because we have not tested is that perhaps the moment that uh, COVID hit, we had more people who felt that they had free time to be able to contribute to the kernel. And uh, we'll come back to that uh, in other slides. Uh, so that might explain why suddenly a jump in terms of the number of uh, commits and contributors during those months. Just tell me next, Daniel. No, um, go ahead, Kate. Okay, so I'll continue. So um, the other thing that we have been very uh, curious about is uh, this notion of sustainability. Um, at the Linux Plumber uh, session last week, it's obvious that the age of the typical Linux kernel developer keeps increasing. And um, there are people like me uh, that they're uh, middle age or even older who um, have been contributed to the kernel for a long time. Those are the people who have the reins of the project. Um, there's a lot of young people too, and uh, but uh, 
from an outsider point of view, it's clear that the older people are the ones who are uh, in charge of the project. We can see that in the age of uh, Linus Torvalds, uh, Greg, and many of the, of, of the main maintainers. And uh, <clears throat> so um, this actually plots uh, the median months of experience. So let me try to explain this a little bit. So at any given month, so let's say January of 2010, this basically says that 50% of the developers have contributed less than 16 months and 50% of the developers have contributed for more than 15, uh, 16 months. So the median essentially divides a population into two chunks, the ones who are above and the ones who are below. At this point, for example, here, uh, this will be March of 2015. And uh, this will mean that 50% uh, of the developers have 16 months of experience and 50% of them will have less than that. So as you can see here, uh, the, the, the months of experience keeps increasing. Now, this is not bad and uh, because you expect that um, in any company, you will expect that um, you want to keep experience within the team. You don't want to have a lot of uh, uh, people leaving and joining your team. And uh, so in general, do you want this to have an, an, an up trajectory? Um, the challenge becomes when you have uh, much more experienced people than new people coming into the team. And at which point this starts to become an issue. Um, it might be interesting, for example, to start to think in terms of um, in how many years do kernel developers expect to uh, retire? And uh, so then a lot of these heavy months of, uh, sorry, many of these people with lots of months of experience will suddenly cease to be part of the kernel and then this curve will start to go down. <clears throat> so this curve goes up because people keep contributing for a long time and it goes down because we have new contributors. Um, this is a, a more fine-grained uh, view of that data, and this requires a little bit of an explanation. So, for every month, we divide the developers into uh, three sets. Okay. Uh, so, let me see if I can do that. So, we have three sets. We have uh, the ones who are uh, let me actually start with the ones that they are one month old. Yeah. So okay. this is this line uh, here, the one that is a, a thin line. So the one month contributors are the people who only contribute for one month and never come back. Those are the people who are uh, maybe for the glory. Uh, they are here because they expect to um, to get some brownie points, be able to maybe put in the resume, maybe because they want to uh, test the waters and they want to try to see whether they can contribute to the kernel. This is an interesting set for the following reasons. One of them is that uh, these people have already committed to um, learn enough of the development process to contribute. They learn how to use the tools. They are willing to go through the stress of uh, submitting patches to the kernel, uh, uh, or, uh, uh, have survived the review process. So these people have um, a level of skill that is sufficient to be able to start contributing, yet they don't stay. And I find this to be an interesting set because uh, we need to understand better what their motivations are. Uh, do they don't stay because that was their uh, their intention from the beginning? Were they drive by contributors who expected just to do one contribution and never come back again? Perhaps that's actually the case. So if, in many cases, that's what they wanted to do only one. In other cases, uh, they might have come, do the work and say, you know what, this is not for me. I don't like the environment. It's too uh, stressful or it's not inclusive enough or it's too much work and I don't have the time to do this. And uh, so that subset is also interesting from the point of view of there's something that perhaps could have been done to keep these people around. 
<clears throat> so that's the, the one time. So these are the people who just come for uh, one month and never come back um, again. So let me actually now uh, go into uh, the green uh, people. So the green people are the ones, uh, sorry, the ones who contribute for the first time. So for example, if a person is in January of 2010, and this is part of this 40 people, that meant that that person contributed in 2010 and contributed at least one month later. So it contributed maybe one more month, maybe two months, maybe a hundred more months. So these are the people who contributed for the first time at that point and keep contributing at least once more in the future. So these are the people who become part of the team uh, somehow. Uh, this plot doesn't have, uh, doesn't demonstrate how, how much they contribute. They just says they actually uh, became part of the contributors. <laughs> And then the corresponding uh, opposite to that is the red line, which essentially means that these people contributed for the last time in that month. So if a person is part of this, uh, let's say uh, 26 people, the red one, it means that in January 2010 was the last time that they contributed. So they're essentially the green people who stopped contributing. And we haven't seen signs so, of them since then. So as you then. can see, sorry, say it again. Yeah, and we haven't seen signs of them since then, basically. So they sort of dropped off and not reappeared. If they reappear, they're counted in, you know, they're not, they'd be counted differently. I'm not understanding what you're saying. Oops, sorry. Keep going, I'll keep quiet. <laughs> yeah, the audio, the audio is, 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 is horrible um, in the presentation for this. So, but anyway, um, so um, they the interest is, so, so let's now look at the trends because it doesn't really matter what the numbers are. I think that what matters is what the curve tells us as a whole. Um, from this period, so for example, from two, uh, uh, 2010 to 2015, we see a little bit of an increase. There's a lot of variability, but you can see that this curve is growing. Um, but this period here, it starts to be flat and then it starts to go slightly. It's almost like we have, uh, let me draw here and uh, slides. Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't think uh, you're. Let me draw again. So um, they can't see you drawing, Daniel. It's something like this, and uh, in that curve. And um, well, the red one, which is the people who leave, it's going up. So more people are leaving than people are renewing the system. Is this problematic? Uh, we don't know. All we see is just the data. Uh, so the data is saying that there are certain trends that are of concern and you need to um, perhaps investigate them further and try to understand better uh, what they mean. I think that there's a very interesting research question in terms of what is the best way to evaluate the sustainability and survival of an open source project and uh, we don't have precise answers um, for that. I'll also just chime in here that um, we stopped the data a year ago, effectively, because that was our threshold. So that's why you're not seeing into 2021. However, March of 2020 is when you're seeing some of the, the key changes kicking in there. You know, um, we yeah, had a lot we more didn't new want people to there. use data after that because uh, the closer we get to the present, uh, the more that this information will be biased. Yeah. Because a person might still contribute, uh, might have a, like a gap of three months and might not be contributing, but they're planning to return. And uh, so we didn't really want to include um, uh, information for the last year. So we just uh, uh, clip it uh, right on August of last year. Mm -hmm. Well, probably, like I say, the, the trends may, some of these people may show up again later and so forth. So revisiting this sort of on a yearly basis will probably tell us whether or not this is significant in some ways. Yeah, and that also becomes an interesting question. So. Um, is, is, is there a significant proportion of developers who come back after one year of inactivity? Um, so what is the likelihood that a person leaves and they will come back? So at which point we basically consider that person to be lost or at which point that person can be um, uh, uh, recoverable within the system? I think that um, there are a lot of interesting questions regarding 
uh, the people who come and they leave. And I think that um, we have, um, as, as a community, as a research community and as open source projects, I don't think that we pay a lot of attention uh, to these people that only do changes once to try to see uh, whether there's something could be done to keep them around and make them uh, become long-term contributors. Right. Because ultimately, um, the survival of, of open source projects depends on having uh, software developers, software developers contributing to uh, the project. You could have uh, all the evangelists and you could have the people doing the documentation, etc. But if you don't have the software developers, then your project will suffer. <clears throat> so let me switch over right now and touch on diversity a little bit. Obviously, there's many, many dimensions of diversity. There's geographic. There's yeah, I'll leave it to you. I'll leave it to you now. Yeah. Continue. <laughs> There's um, geographic, gender, age. Um, we can touch on all of them, but you know the ones that's easiest for us to step, um, do analysis and we've been sort of trending with is uh, looking at the gender one right now here. And um, the women, um, so these, these plots are from Daniel and we're looking at the proportion of women per each release. And that's been plotted that way. Um, at the starting point, obviously it's a lot of variability because very few numbers. And then as we've been going along, you know, we're getting over between 7.5 you know, 7 to 10% each release. Okay. And relative though, so there's the absolute proportion in blue, and then there's the actual relative number. So you actually have the scale of the numbers kicking in. Oops. And this is a much more sensitive touch pad. So you know, we're seeing about 150 women contributing to each release, which for most projects is actually kind of a good number. Um, but the challenge is, of course, in relative scale to the overall, um, we are sort of, you know, there's so many more men, obviously, that we're at about, you know, almost 10%, but there's still more space to go. And one of the things that Daniel's been, you know, focusing on a bit is, you know, how many of the commits have been authored by a woman? And these are the ones that the women only showed. And again, we sort of can touch up towards about 10% of a release. But in the recent years, it's sort of, like I say, in the last year and so forth, in 2020, from March onwards, you know, the question is, is it was going on in quite a nice little trajectory upward, but we have a little bit of a blip. So I was, like, I was sort of hypothesizing that there was an impact and things happening with COVID were happening more that way. So that's where we, that's where we started all these discussions off to try to understand is there anything there or not that's significant and only time will tell probably at this point. Am I making more comments about that, Daniel? Um, I'm not understanding what you're saying. Oh, dear. Um, the audio through the conference system is not very good, so I, I, I don't quite understand what you're saying. Uh oh. Okay, um, just a second. Let me see. Let me just try something Go here. The Oops. Menu on your computer and improve that. Let's see if this will help. Does that make it better? Or no? Yeah, it sounds a little bit better. Okay, it was on the other side, that's why. So I was just basically commenting, we can't really tell um, after March 2020 whether that drip is significant or it will be continuing on the upper trends eventually. Data's too young. This point. Um, Kate, sorry to interrupt you. There is a latency of around ten seconds between the Zoom session and when I hear on the other side. Mm. Lovely. <laughs> so, uh, so I cannot actually talk to you. So, uh, what I hear here in Zoom is very different than when I hear there. So, if I respond to the questions there, it will take around ten seconds before before you hear me. Okay. Okay. So, Lots of I'll, I'll I'll just keep it here. So, because otherwise. <clears throat> okay. So the other factor, I hear you now better. Yeah. Yeah. The other factor that Daniel um, followed on is, um, you know, w focusing on women who commit others' code. I mean, sort of an indicator of seniority in the kernel. Um, they provide, you know, commits, they provide guidance and so forth. And the interesting challenge is we only have 17 women who've ever done it out of the 701 contributors, about 2.5%. So while overall, um, in terms of developers, we're sort of seeing 75 to 10%. Um, the maintainer type of, or those who are basically in the pipeline um, for commit and so forth, is only about 
So the challenge is going to be how do we start bringing that pipeline on board? And some of it's going to be a function of, you know, time and what motivates people to sort of start to step up to do more of these type of maintainer roles. And certainly the maintainer shortage is a well-known problem. And there is a reasonable pool of uh, women here potentially that might be, if we can figure out the right motivations, help, help this problem along. And then there's um, the commits by the non-author emerges, and then again, women only are being shown. And, and there we've, you know, we've got that 2.5, but the number of commits and so forth per release is, um, this was a big spike that happened back there, but for the most part, it tracks proportionally to the actual absolute numbers that are happening in each release. So there certainly is, Indicators, though, um, again, what was sort of happening in February of 2020 to today, it's sort of like, it looks like, is there something going on here? Still don't know, but it was interesting. Any comments you want to say about these, Daniel, before I go on? Yeah, so I think that um, <clears throat> some of, one of the, uh, the, the simple explanations for this is that women are younger in the system, so therefore don't have the level of responsibility that comes with seniority. So that might explain actually why there are um, significantly fewer changes and significantly fewer uh, women part of it. I think that um, it would be more interesting to do all of this analysis by uh, generations. So the people who start contributing in 2010 um, where do they end? Um, what portion of them become long-term contrib long contributors? Of those who become long-term contributors, uh, which ones take a role of um, committing code for somebody else? And, uh, and how does it break by gender? So uh, the raw numbers don't look very, uh, very useful, but I think that to make a, a, an adequate conclusion, uh, it will be necessary to really take into consider consideration uh, not to compare it against the entire population, but compare it against the population of people who started at the same time as them. Effectively a cohort. Yes. Okay. So, as you can see, we can't really draw really strong conclusions yet from the data we're seeing. But um, one of the things last week we had at Linux Plumbers, um, we ran a survey as part of the Plumbers event um, to pull that audience. What do they think is significant? It was an anonymous survey, um, and we just wanted to see what they were thinking about what's happening in the future and what the trends lines are. Um, There's about 1,000 attendees, and we had about 203 responses to a very short, simple survey. And so one of the first questions is, um, you know, do you think Linux will be as popular 10 years from now as it is today? And the answer is pretty overwhelmingly yes. <laughs> Um, 96 percent. Now that's kind of interesting in the sense that I, I interpret that personally as uh, trust in the seniority, the senior people in the in the project, and um, they you know feel like it's on a good trend line, and I don't think anyone's too worried about that. However, when you start looking into 20 years from now, well. Between 10 and 20 years is when we'll probably see a bunch of people retire, so that could be a part of it. Most people, you know, think it's on a solid, but about a third, you know, don't feel confident 20 years from now. Now, this is, you know, Colonel, you know, this is the plumbers community. It's certainly not representative industry at all, but it was an interesting insight. And, you know, get back to the sustainability question. What's going to make things sustainable? What's going to make things you know, how do we, how do we, how do we see the problem and, you know, how can we put steps into address? And then we added a few other questions that I thought were kind of interesting. Um, you know, do you think the Git will be still used to collect and manage patches 24 years from now? Well, I think that's a vote of confidence in the Git system that, you know, 20 years from now, everyone still thinks they'll be using Git or 77% do. And, you know, a bunch of others are, you know, not sure. But I don't definitely know. So I think Git for developers is working out fairly well as a way for distributed um, sharing and collaboration on code is kind of how I take and interpret those numbers. Um, 
The next question we had is, do you, do you think that contributions will continue to come in via mailing lists in 20 years from now? This has been a t uh, source of tension. Um, in LKML, the, the rate of it is such that you basically need a bot to manage it or for yourself and to focus on the things you want to keep, keep track of. And that workflow is pretty much baked into the whole kernel repositories. And there's been tensions for new developers coming in to actually master that email workflow and frustrations have been heard in various surveys along the way. And so I think that's starting to show up in here. That, um, you know, some people are, you know, 25% are saying yes, it will be. Others are saying no. Others aren't sure. So the email workflow, um, there's is something possibly that, you know, it's being under discussion at the kernel community multiple times and probably will continue to be under discussion as you know, people age and as a generation's age, you know, the senior developers who are very efficient with it, the new ones are probably less so. So trying to figure out, you know, is this an area that we should be focusing on um, with the, you know, from the development flow, workflow perspectives, I think is things that get talked about at the Maintainer Summit. We we'll probably continue to get talked about at the Maintainer Summit for the next 10 years until we figure out something that makes people effective and happy. You know, uh, if you're contributing to other open source projects and they're on their GitHub or GitLab, the interfaces are a lot easier for a new developer to come by, put a contribution in and, and to, you know, participate. So that's an inter that was sort of an interesting trend. And then the other question, because of last week, um, all the Rust talks that were then, and the security aspects and the safety aspects is, you know, do you think that the links will remain fully, you know, primarily implemented in C? And 43%, 44% said yes. But um, we have about a third saying no. And, you know, there's a lot of actually really good discussions going on in the Rust with Rust and, you know, how can we make the um, security of the kernel safer? So I guess to wrap it up, um, conclusions we've got so far is, you know, pretty much the kernel is vibrant, active, and it, you know, remained fairly resilient with the challenges implemented by COVID-19. You know, there's no really statistically significant slowdown that we can, you know, trust at this point. And there's possibly even an increase from the numbers you were seeing at the start. The trend lines are up. There's more commits. There's more contributors. Um, you know, we're hitting these new milestones all the time. But some groups are being impacted, but we can't be authoritative. Potentially, um, you know, the, um, like I say, the women may or may not have, quite frankly, been impacted. There's fewer women that came in that line was flatter over the year, but, you know, ask me in two years' time, I'll probably be able to be a bit more authoritative. Um, however, the sustainability focus is important. Um, you know, as we transition the current leadership, as people age and retire and get tired of working on the kernel, uh, making sure we have a diverse pool of new contributors and to keep things um, vibrant going forward. And part of doing that is to really understand the motivations um, for the new contributors and, you know, what is going to motivate them to stay, contribute, and be effective in the communal community, since we all have depended on it. And that is pretty much what I had for um, guests today and what Daniel has been sharing with some of the things that we sort of talked about through the course of the year and discussions on these topics. But does anyone have any questions? Looking around the room, Daniel, no one's raising a hand or opening their mouth. So, <laughs> however, we did get enough people sort of eyes following, and I don't see anyone snoring. So, I guess that's a good sign. Go for it. Not that we've been able to tell from the numbers yet. Um, like I say, we were seeing a lot more, but it, it's hard for us. Like most of the corporates went remote, so there's no real data to let us see that. What was the question, Kate? Um, Can you repeat it? Do we do we have any? Um, sorry, my apologies, Daniel. Do we have any data showing the you know distribution between the corporate contributions when COVID started and the community? Did I paraphrase that correctly. Um, okay, good. And we really didn't do any analysis yeah, no, I, I, there. And that's something. 
yeah, I, I was going to mention that that's something that we want to look at. And uh, there's a little bit of threat to validity because sometimes people uh, use uh, a public um, email address. We see a lot of contributions from Gmail. And, uh, but it's obvious that uh, there is influence by the organizations. And in fact, uh, my personal opinion, and this is more hypothesis, is that uh, the through survival of, of, of the kernel doesn't depend on volunteers who join the kernel, but it depends on organizations who join the kernel and put developers to work on the features that the companies are required. So the true agents that control the future of the kernel are not volunteers, but are companies who have a vested interest on in the survival of the kernel. Thank you for the question, though. <laughs> if there's no more questions, then I will say thank you and appreciate your patience with us as we manage to figure out how to uh, get this to work. Thanks.